Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lynn Crocker, TIFF's Industry Programming Manager. It's, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of our two dialogue sessions focusing on virtual reality today. Our first session is Creative Concept Meets Practical Design, and our second session will be Mapping Sustainable Business Models, which is co-presented with the Canada Media Fund. Right now, I would like to welcome our guest, Sandra Collins, Vice President of Operations and CFO of Canada Media Fund, to say a few words of welcome to you. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank the Toronto International Film Festival and TIFF Dialogues for hosting us here today, and of course, for putting together one of the largest and most prestigious film festivals in the world right here in Canada. It's a pleasure for us to be here today and introduce this afternoon's panel on creative content meets practical design. Today, our speakers will shed some light on the complex work that is required to reconcile compelling audiovisual storytelling with a technology still in an experimental stage where creative production and post-production teams must work together in uncharted territory to build cohesive blueprints for VR projects. New workflows and technologies have allowed VR creators to flourish in the past several years, but I don't think there's any doubt that 2016 seems to be the year of virtual reality. Eight of the, top, eight of the Fortune top 10 technology giants are now in the VR business, with several other tech innovators investing in the technology, trying to get ahead of the market. Studies suggest that global market for VR could reach 162 billion US dollars by 2020. Primarily driven by the proliferation of various uses for VR technology and content, from entertainment to healthcare, through education and industrial applications, new ways of using VR are constantly being developed. Today, Canadian co companies are at the forefront of digital media innovation. Thanks to the reputation of Canadian digital media content, the expertise acquired by producer, and a funding ecosystem that supports innovation and creative storytelling, Canada is well positioned to lead in the promising VR market and to respond to consumer trends. The Canada Media Fund is proud to be at the epicenter of this funding ecosystem. We've supported 37 innovative VR projects by providing over $25 million in funding to this medium alone. We believe that Canadian and international audiences should be able to access compelling content on any device of their choice, and we want Canadian-produced content to remain at the forefront of up-and-coming trends. We're seeing near, nearly boundless applications for Canadian VR, and its impact on the way we experience content is palpable. Many questions, though. What are the unique challenges and creative possibilities of this burgeoning medium? What makes large-scale VR production possible? What will it take to make VR development more appealing to producers and therefore increase this offer to consumers? So we look forward to hearing from the panel on some of these questions. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, thank you, Sandra. <laughs> And now I would like to introduce you to the moderator for this discussion and our panelists. Moderating is uh, Director of TIFF's Digital Studio, Jody Segru, and our panelists are Irene Vandertrop, Aaron Weintraub, Ryan Cummings, Randall Okita, and John Helliker. Welcome, everyone. choreographed that backstage, it was much smoother. Um, so thanks everyone, welcome to the panel. Uh, I'm super excited that virtual reality has been the focus of the conversation throughout industry conferences. 
Um, I think virtual reality is one of the biggest equalizers in the sense that we're all trying to figure it out and we're all kind of experimenting and learning from each other. And, um, uh, you know, I think this is, the, this is the time for the pioneers, the adventurers, the ones who are, we're kind of defining the rules of storytelling. And so it makes me really happy to be on stage with these five brains who are part of the experimenters and the adventurers and the pioneers defining those rules. So I'm super excited for this conversation. Um, and I thought the way we would start is kind of maybe going from that end with Randall back here and just, uh, if you guys wouldn't mind just introducing um, yourself and if you want to say a little bit or say a little something about your company or a project that you're currently working on, the Virtual Reality 360 space that you absolutely love. Uh, let's start there. Sure. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. My name's Randall. Um, I am a filmmaker um, primarily. I also work um, in installation and sculpture a little bit. And right now I'm working on a room scale VR project <clears throat> with the National Film Board um, that's sort of dealing a lot with uh, large scale virtual installations and kinetic sculptures and what that experience is like in VR. Hi, my name is John Helliker and I'm director of the CERT Center, which is uh, Sheridan College's uh, Screen Industries Research and Training Center. And we have a, a 10,000 square foot soundstage at Pinewood Toronto Studios. We work extensively with, with industry uh, on, on innovation in different areas. And uh, over the last six years, most of our work has been in the area of, of digital cinema and gaming and, and uh, virtual production for film and television. But I'd say in the last, uh, the last year, probably 60, 70% of what we're doing is in the, the, the virtual reality space. Hi guys, uh, my name is Ryan Cummins. I'm a VR VFX supervisor at uh, Legend, um, and we've got an office here in Toronto, and then as well, uh, as well one in LA. Um, we've done, by the time we wrap, the ones we're finishing right now, about 20 different experiences, ranging from full live action, full CG, mono, stereo, some interactive, some non. So we've kind of really tried to hit all the different marks on the um, kind of cinematic story and the different visual storytelling elements to see what works and what doesn't. Hi, my name is Irene Vandertop, and I'm the head of production at Deep Inc. based here in Toronto. It's a um, production company for cinematic uh, virtual reality. And um, we also have uh, a company, Liquid Cinema, which is actually a software aimed at creating and distributing um, interactive narrative cinematic VR. Um, one of the works that you might have seen is uh, Edge of Space, which is also run, running at the Fiverr's Festival. And um, uh, we apply new uh, methods to uh, storytelling that are technology driven. And we're using those in uh, deployment um, of infrastructures at various broadcasters, mostly in, uh, in Europe. We work together with a lot of the European and mostly German broadcasters like RT and ZDF. Uh, my name is Aaron Weintraub. Um, I'm a senior visual effects supervisor uh, and co-founder of Mr. X, uh, which is a visual, visual effects company here in Toronto. Um, we uh, just wrapped work on Ben-Hur, including the, the Ben-Hur 360 experience to go along with it. Um, currently working on uh, Guillermo del Toro's new film, uh, The Shape of Water. Uh, among other projects, television, we do the, the series Vikings, um, The Strain, Penny Dreadful, um, among other things. And uh, we're finishing up well, what, what may be hopefully the, uh, the last uh, Resident Evil film in the franchise, um, along with the Resident Evil 360 experience to go with it. Lots of name dropping there. <laughs> um, all right, well, so I'm gonna leverage this wealth of experience. And the first question I'm gonna ask is, if you had to give one piece of advice to someone who has never done VR 360, um, what's the first thing you would tell them to do? Or were there some miscon misconceptions you would kind of warn them away from? Any, anyone? Jump into it. Uh, yeah. we already, all of us kind of as a group kind of discussed this a little bit backstage, but... Um, You're giving it all away. Yeah. L leading one question to the other of uh, misconception is um, you think you know what you're doing coming from the skill sets or the experience that you have, whether it be from gaming or the feature film industry. So you have an idea, you know, I've been doing this for years, I know what to do, I'm just gonna do it in 360 now. And the reality is once you go to do your very first project, half the things you know go straight out the window. Everything has to be thought differently and how you achieve the same ideas and feelings might not work the exact same way that they do in traditional cinema. 
And so um, a big advice that we all agree here on, just be watch as much content as you can. See what works, see what doesn't, see what is kind of close to your style or what the story you're trying to tell and see as much um, good and bad things as you can from everybody else's work because everybody's kind of all in this together in this exper uh, experimental stage and as much as you can learn from everybody else and that'll just help you that much more when you go out to do your first thing yourself. So I guess following up on that in terms of uh, misconceptions, we deal with, uh, with uh, across the board with gaming and, and with uh, cinematic VR and, and I get so many comments from people that uh, the future of, of, uh, of VR is in gaming. Uh, and that cinematic VR has, has limited potential, and I disagree with that totally. Uh, the other associated uh, comment that I get is that the role of the director is minimized, uh, that you, you're basically putting a camera in place, uh, so all of the, the things that a director does are, are, are reduced in, in scope within VR, and I, I don't believe that at all. I would also say if you want to get into 360 or VR, um, get yourself a rig and just take it everywhere you go and shoot the hell out of it. Just experiment. Just take it anywhere and, and try everything and don't let other people influence like, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Just really experiment with it and, and learn from your own mistakes. It will be a steep learning curve. But uh, as you said, also look at, look at other people's works but because what you'll see is that a lot of work, um, you'll see a lot of things that do, don't work or that doesn't work and, and you can really learn from that. Kind of what you just bounce off what you just said when you said, um, you know, kind of figure out the do's and don'ts. And, you know, there's certain rules that have kind of been established for VR, but um, even within the last year, I've seen a lot of those rules get broken and be very mm -hmm. successful. And so part of it is when you're watching these things and you're seeing what work and what doesn't work, think about why it doesn't work. Can you do and pull that off if you just tweaked something or did it a little bit differently? Would you take something that was a, a rule breaker before or something that didn't work in a piece, tweak it ever so slightly and all of a sudden it's an amazing shot? Yeah, exactly. So that's interesting. So what are some of the rules that have been broken and what makes a good VR project then? Because you've talked about what doesn't work, what does make a good VR project? Well, for instance, one of the things that people say, like you have to have a certain distance to the camera um, or you can't, you can't make close-ups in VR. Uh, we have actually successfully done uh, micro photography in VR. But uh, one of the problems that you have with VR is that uh, you can't have, you don't have a focal length. You, 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 if, you put, if I put him in, in focus, then all the rest is out of focus. Um, what if somebody comes in on an incoming shot and looks at that way where everything is bl blurry because he's in focus? So that is uh, part, of, part of the problems that you have with VR. So, but we solved it with something called forced perspective. So you can come into a new shot and have a close-up of somebody um, because that is the first shot, that, the first direction that you're seeing in that shot. And then you can look around, but you understand the context because he's the main focus of the shot. Mm. I think, that, I think there are other rules, um, you know, another example would be something like showing the body in, in the experience. Um, you know, it's all, you know, shot from what's meant to be kind of a first person perspective. And, you know, we always have the, the debate, well, do you look down? What do I see when I look down? Should I see, like, shirt, body, pants? Uh, what happens if, if it's a different gender? What if it's not what I'm wearing? What if I'm a different height? How, you know, how does that affect it? Is it just a weird disembodying experience because, you know, what if I look straight down, do I see, is it a neck hole? Like there's all those kinds of, you know, they're, they're questions that need to be answered. Or even if you just wanted an arm, well, you can have an arm because maybe you're, you're holding a flashlight or there's some object in there, but does it connect to something else? And I think, you know, like Ryan's saying, it's like you try it and really there are, like there are rules, but there are no rules. Like it's so new. Um, and it's, it's like developing every day and like a, a misconception, back to the first question, would be um, that it's, it's established, you know, that people know what they're doing, you know, it's even, I mean, but even with film, there are no, there are some rules, but there are still rules that people are breaking and that's kind of how the art form works. Yeah, I feel like it's less rules than just <clears throat> questions that haven't been answered yet, you know, mm -hmm. challenges and it's because of the newness of, of, of so many of the technologies, it's, you know, you have what feels right and what feels wrong. So there's this, you know, these psychological gaps and, you know, the body being the perfect example, you know, people are trying things and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't and then somebody will solve it and then that becomes the standard until, you know, the next challenge arises. The, the body one's an interesting one um, because we just, uh, for Comic-Con, um, 
recently in uh, San Diego, we worked with MPC and we did the uh, Suicide Squad VR piece. And we did the point of view where they wanted you to be Harley Quinn. So there was a body. And it was a weird thing because, you know, immediately you go back to the, you know, you treat the camera as a person. And so you're putting someone in there and it's supposed to be them, but they look down, you're like, am I young, am I old, am I uh, a boy or a girl and everything? And I think um, the Suicide Squad one worked up to a, uh, an extent for that because it's an established character. It's Harley Quinn. Like if you know going in, you're gonna be a very specific character and you're experiencing something through their eyes, which is what it was. It was a behind the scenes of her going through a fight scene. That works, but if you, if you're, if there's no specific reason that you're going to show a body and then it just completely helps take you out of the experience. You're no longer looking for how people are interacting with you and any emotional connections and things like that. You're just looking at like, why am I an eight year old boy all of a sudden? And like, and stuff like that. Um, but even with that, we ran into the similar issues like with the neck. You know, it's like, cool, it's, you know, it's Harley Quinn, you totally see her, she's fighting her way through, but then you look down and, you know, there, there's no head. So mm -hmm. there's still certain things that you try it and certain parts are really successful and there's others that you still gotta, you know, try and figure out the better way to do it next time. I think an important part of that is, is that uh, there is a prototyping process and I think that, that people should be open and, and should, should try different things and, and on a particular piece, what, what worked on another piece doesn't necessarily work on your piece. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's a case of, of, of hands or body, try it without, try, try it with, uh, with generic uh, uh, arms that, that, that don't have a, you know, the full uh, photorealism. Try it, try it with a body. I mean, really prototyping and, and having people come in and, and, and actually go through that experience and observe and, and talk to them about how they felt about it is a really important thing to do. Shoot safety shots. <laughs> if you, if you want to go for something and you're not quite sure if it's going to work, have a backup plan. So that way, if that one shot just is going to ruin the experience, it doesn't ruin the overall story and your experience as a whole. So if you have some really cool idea, like you said, prototype it, shoot it, and then also have a safety just in case. A metaphor for life, too, not just VR. Um, I mean, this is for you, um, but anyone can jump in afterward. But just based on the range of projects that Deep Ink does, what are key challenges facing TV and filmmakers in storytelling and creating immersive content for VR? Um, so one of, the, um, one of the problems that filmmakers face is um, how do you create um, uh, empathy or uh, an emotional comp uh, impact on the viewer, or on the person that's watching a piece? Because yes, we can create these am amazing immersive experiences and we can create proximity more than any other medium. But at the same time, there's a real challenge in project, uh, projecting your feelings onto the protagonist or onto a, um, a, a scene, whether it is the main character being in the, in the scene or whether you try to project your feelings onto, onto somebody who is with you in the scene. Um, in traditional media, this has all kind of been figured out and you can tell very effective stories that are, have a big emotional impact in, um, in traditional films, uh, traditional storytelling because you have the language of juxtaposition where you can combine shots that tell together a story because in your brain you can put them together and and you create meaning out of these shots but in virtual reality you can't really use that same technique of cutting time and space and and juxtaposing uh, shots that create meaning so it's it's very difficult actually to create uh, empathy and um, uh, an emotion in, in VR. What, what does happen is that you really feel like you're in this environment, but it's, um, you don't feel with the characters as much as you can with, um, uh, with, with, with a traditional uh, film. And I think that that will be solved. That's just one of the problems of the language that we can solve with, um, uh, with by experimenting and by doing more, uh, experiment, doing more in VR and really playing with this medium. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Uh, I, I really react uh, negatively to the, the concept of, of an empathy machine that, that has been used as a term with VR. And the idea that you can turn it on and turn it off uh, and, it, and it has that impact is, is to me uh, a disservice. Uh, I believe very strongly that, that, that immersion and sense of presence and empathy and action that comes out of that uh, is, is much heightened within a, a virtual reality situation, but I agree that it needs to be worked on. We, we have a project right now that we're just starting 
called Virtual Reality and Global Citizenship that we're, we've been funded for, that we're working with uh, Huffington Post, Riot Huffington, Huffington Post and, and others to, uh, to do four VR pieces that deal with climate change or uh, drunk driving, different, different social issues and working with those groups. But as part of it, there's a, there's a user experience study really looking at, at how has empathy been increased or has it been? I mean, if you look at it in terms of stuff, action, social action in a lot of cases is based on empathy, but empathy doesn't necessarily re, uh, result in action. So there's, there's a lot of different links that have to be looked at and, and how VR in a particular case increases empathy and action is really questionable. And so in, in a lot of VR storytelling, everyone talks about how do you want somebody to feel when they're, they're experiencing it. In some ways, that ties into what you're saying. How do you want somebody to feel and then act? Can you explain, or anyone here, if you want to explain, how, what does that mean? And when you're getting ready to create an experience, how do you go about evoking that in virtual reality or 360? Um, I think part of it is, you know, you have like the, the writer, the director, and they've got their story that they're trying to tell and they have those emotions and they're thinking of it in their head from like the traditional film standpoint of framing and composition and the edit to try and invoke all those things. And like my job, for example, being on like the, the creative supervisor side is to, okay, you know, tell me your story. What do you want to do? Let's break it down, see what works, what doesn't work, you know, and it's not so much like it's gonna ruin the piece. We can't have a specific shot that just doesn't exist in VR. It's making the directors and very much client education. And you know, what are you trying to achieve with this shot? What's the feeling? What's the story? What's the point of it? And let's figure out a different method to showcase that and get the same feeling across. So that way, I, you know, I'm not telling you no by saying you can't do this like really close up over the shoulder. I'm telling you, you know, we're gonna get the exact same result and the exact same feeling for the, the viewer, but we're gonna do it this way instead and the reason that it lends itself to it. And um, we actually are wrapping, I think it's launching today. There's a, there's a whole project, it's a series, it's called Project Empathy. And it's a, a social kind of injustice thing about like wrongful imprisonment and things like that. Um, and the one that we just wrapped and is getting launched today is called Left Behind. And it's basically, you are from the point of view of uh, a young girl and you're at the playground with your mother and all of a sudden she gets arrested and it goes through the psychological, like how does it feel to be a little girl having your mother arrested in front of you, dragged away, going to visit her in a visitation room where she's wearing an orange jumpsuit and there's all these strangers around you and eventually you end up in a foster home. And we were really excited to do this one because it was one of the projects that we've done. A lot of it's been more like entertainment type style stuff, but um, to do one that the whole entire thing was about to pulling on those heartstrings and really, you know, putting you in that person's shoes and getting you emotionally attached to them, that just watching it the way that, you know, the mother's getting ripped away from you or the way she's looking at you, so sad in the visitation room and everything, and then the kids that you're interacting with the foster home that, um, you can definitely pull on those heartstrings and get empathy out depending on like the story and how you shoot it and everything like that. Yeah, I mean, I think certain um, aspects of traditional filmmaking definitely fall away, uh, like you're saying, your framing, composition, and editing, certainly, um, but certain other aspects get much more heightened. So <clears throat> it becomes about like your set design, your art direction, your setting up the environment, um, music. I mean, music has always been used to say, you know, how am I supposed to feel at this point? And that's, you know, that's how music works in traditional film and television. Um, and that could be used, you know, to, to the same effect. Um, performances, like you're saying, like a perfect example is like a mother's long look, you know, a, just a long shot of her being sad is there because it's not really time specific, right? Yeah. The, like one of the, I mean, and maybe it's because I'm you know, used to traditional media, but you know, as we go into this, one of my you know, anxieties when I watch a virtual reality project is am I watching it correctly? You know, am I looking in where I'm, am I looking, watching where I'm supposed to look right at this time? Um, I feel like you know, I'll be looking at something, exploring some, some detail on the set. I'll hear some sound that will cue me to look. I'll be like, oh, should I have been looking there before the sound came out? Did I just miss the reveal of something that I was supposed to see? And there's a whole, it's, it's really interesting about, you know, did, I, did I watch it correctly, didn't I? Does it matter? And I think that, that whole does it matter question needs to, you know, that's how it plays out. Like you need to build your project so that it doesn't matter, you know, so that there is no way to watch it wrong. Um, or, or that it, it, 
you know, it, it wants to be rewatched. You yeah. Know, like and you watch it again, like, oh, I, I remember that thing happened. I'd love to watch again and look over in that direction to see what that was. So there's the repeatability factor, but even for, for the first time view, you need to build it in such a way that, you know, there are no things that are gonna leave the viewer feeling anxious about, you know, having watched it incorrectly. I think to that extent, it's also important for the director of the piece to know how the audience is behaving when, when, with their piece. And for this, uh, uh, what we use is actually heat mapping. So uh, you can watch back how, uh, how users are watching your experience and it aggregates all the viewpoints um, so many times per second. And then if you watch back, you can really, sometimes you find that uh, what you assume that your viewers are always looking at, they're actually not, or maybe they are. And then you, then you can really c um, uh, massage your piece to work optimally for your audience. And that just shows kind of how far VRs came recently. You know, about two years ago, they would just be like, oh, I'm just going to make this thing and I'm just going to see what people's reactions are and see how it turns out. And now with like the heat mapping and everything is you can almost do what they do for traditional films and they do pre-screenings and they mm -hmm. see how people's reactions, see if they do reshoots, rewrites to where now we're getting to that level in VR where you can come up with a story, have an edit together, show it to a bunch of people, see how the heat maps come out and say, okay, yes, everybody hit that, that point. Everybody saw that ooh, you know, 80% of the people miss this thing. What am I doing wrong? Is it something with its placement or the sound or maybe there's a color or something I can do to make it pop? And so, you know, you can try and help as much as you can kind of do what he said about, like, you know, trying to guide them and get them to look where you want. And um, even though I mentioned that composition framing is kind of gone, um, I tell people it's almost like composition over time to where traditionally, you know, with a still, with a frame, they're following their eyes and the composition based on the framing, but because the framing's now full 360, it's almost composition over time, and you're having a global composition based on visual cues and audio cues to guide them throughout the experience. Right. And like you said, you know, do you, am I already supposed to be looking there, or is it not, uh, did I miss something, that the replay value? I love watching a group of people all watch the same experience and then watch them talk about it afterwards and every single person had a different experience, but because of them discussing it, everybody wants to go back and watch it again and watch it again because they wanna see what everybody else saw and everybody missed and so I love the fact that a lot of this has so much replayability versus, you know, oh, we just made this piece and everybody watched it once and it dies off. I think a lot of this has a lot of lasting um, power. I just wanted to comment on what you're saying is that you don't have the framing uh, anymore and that it's kind of framing all around. Um, actually, uh, what uh, our technology allows directors to use the fr uh, framing as a method because um, we are using what is called uh, forced perspective, which is one of the techniques of our software, which um, uh, programmatically reorients the sphere or redirects it on each incoming shot to that part of the scene that the director wants you to look at. So every time you have a cut, you're always looking at that what you were meant to look at, no, what, no matter whether you're sitting like this or like this. So in that way, we're giving back control to the directors. So that's one of the aspects of the Liquid Cinema software that it does. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Did, does that require like a special play? Like you can't watch something like that on, on YouTube, YouTube no. or Facebook 360? No, like. you need a special player for that, that's right. So I have a question really quickly for um, Aaron and Ryan, but other people can jump in. I'm asking because of your 360, uh, we're talking about 360 now, music videos. What's the difference between making a 360 music video or a video like Ben-Hur, the 360 uh, chariot race, versus the nar a narrative uh, and approach and production? Um, like as you start <clears throat> this project. Well, I mean, what's, what's the difference? I mean, I, I can tell you, but the, so the genesis of of the Ben-Hur 360 experience really just grew out of working on the film. So we did, you know, hundreds of shots, uh, traditional visual effects for, you know, the Ben-Hur chariot race, and kind of late in the game, you know, the, the distributor and the studio were seeing it and said, oh, you know, it would be great if we, you know, just did a little, v, you know, a little 360 film um, of doing a couple laps around the track from Judah Ben-Hur's perspective. You know, given that we have all these assets anyway, how can we, how do we leverage you know, your experience and the CG and your pipeline to, you know, essentially what became for us, like, oh, well, let's just do another shot. Um, yes, it was, you know, a 2,500 frame long shot, um, but to the extent that, you know, they, they, they would have tried to go to another company to do that and it had us kind of hand over the assets and our pipeline. I mean, I, I don't see, especially as the, 
as late as they did come to us, I don't see how it could have ever possibly worked. I mean, we have the, the horse, the fur, the hair, the simulations, the tax, like all the, the riding stuff figured out. Um, it made the most sense to come to us and have us do it. So um, we just kind of put that shot into, in, we put it into the pipeline and it seemed to sort of just drive itself. Like we had all the moments, all the narrative moments of things that happened during the race from the film. And we said, okay, well, we'll, we'll kind of condense that into a two, you know, we'll take a seven lap race and turn it into a two lap race and we'll put this here and then these guys will crash over there. And we, you know, just kind of blocked it out and that became the narrative and the story of it. Uh, hmm. Very cool. Yeah. And then uh, I'll talk on the, the 360 music video side of it then. Um, we did, the first time we ever did a music video was for Apple Music and the band Muse. And we did um, the traditional 2D um, flat video as well as the VR version of uh, their song called Revolt. And when we first got brought on board about it, um, they had already shot it. Um, we were meeting with um, the director, Guy Shelmerdine, and we were talking about everything. And it was really interesting because, you know, a lot of music videos are already very experimental to begin with because, you know, they're shorter, so you can take bigger risks. And for this one, you know, we were talking about how they were shooting it and what the story was. And, you know, uh, the album's called Drones, and the song Revolt, you know, talks about um, these rebels kind of revolting against this like military force and everything. And so what they end up doing is everything was shot with a cable cam and then you're from the point of view of one of these drones. And so all of a sudden it was like, okay, we're now placing that person in the scene as a robot. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's stuff like empathy kind of goes out the window because you're a robot. You're not going to feel things. What does a robot do? They're very analytical and calculating and things like that. So all of a sudden, uh, all the care and how things looked and felt completely shifted because we were putting them in a completely different world for the video. And so, you know, there's lots of close-ups like on the band and certain courses and things like that. Um, and then we had a bunch of... Um, motion graphics like heads up display overlays that was all like scanning and tracking searching through the rebels and stuff like that so it was a really different approach than some of the other stuff because you know it was like there was a story but it was more so about the song and the music and the you know band members and everything yeah and the environment really showing off like the their stage basically and so that was an, uh, an interesting approach especially not trying to have any real emotional attachment and very like cold and calculative and stuff like that. You didn't want people to feel anything. They're robots. <laughs> um, so Randall, just really quickly for you, um, uh, with your current work with the VR lab here in Toronto, what have you found are the differences between 360 and room scale from both experience and development perspective? Because you've been doing a lot of kinetic sculpture and installation artwork, and now you're transferring that into the VR world. For me, uh, you know, room scale was a was a big, big game changer for people who don't know what room scale is. It's it's a, a VR experience that you can walk around in. So you have to set up sort of a, you know, six by six space in your home or office, and you can walk around. And um, for me, it was a huge change in tr in terms of um, the amount of engagement and possibility um, that you could put into an experience. But yeah, it completely changes the workflow. So as opposed to a 360 video experience, you know, as soon as you can walk around, you want to walk around. As soon as you can engage with objects and explore, you know, you want to do more of that. Um, so back to sort of your question about what you want the, the viewer to experience. Um, I mean, for me, I think it always still starts in the same place. What is the story you're trying to tell? What's the message you're trying to convey? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing, I think, across VR, but especially, you know, in each different kind of VR, of which there is many and they are all evolving, um, you know, you have to take into account these things that are happening. You know, when we're doing user testing, which I think is a huge part, especially for room scale, because you're talking about a lot more programmatic and generated um, assets that are coming from, um, you know, essentially a, a, a VFX workflow. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it completely changes things. And then in accounting for your user experience, you, know, you have to take into account novelty and nervousness and you know, these ideas of people just looking behind them. And there's, there's a whole sort of uh, space there that, that people are going to want to adjust. So you have to kind of build that into your story. Um, and then for me, what I've been really 
uh, trying to fuse is these different kinds of workflows. Whereas for a, say a live action, very specific you know, music video or film, you have a script, you shoot for that script, you edit for that script and you kind of go in a direct line and everything kind of comes together at the very end. Whereas um, in a VR experience, especially in room scale, in my experience, um, you know, it's much more of, uh, you know, a gaming development or soft, like you have to incorporate some of those other workflows in terms of building something early, testing it, um, talking to people, and, you know, for all of your assets, you're working with visual effects artists, you're working with an animation workflow, and for a lot of live action people, you know, jumping into VR, they're running into these walls, or um, I feel like a lot of, um, companies that I've talked to with gaming experience that are trying to get into a VR, a cinematic VR experience, you know, they're running into the same thing in terms of talking about the role of the director being minimized or kind of working out the story ahead of time. So I think eventually it will level out, whereas right now, you know, we're user testing and somebody will say, you know, their feedback on the experience will be, you know, the headset was heavy. And that's, you know, the, so you have everything from sort of people that are trying this kind of thing for the first time to people that have tons of experience and they're getting very specific about, you know, the way your hands interact with certain things. So I think it'll level out, but uh, that's been the, the, the big difference for me in terms of, of the room scale stuff. That just brought up a really good point when you said uh, the, the feedback was the headset's too heavy. Um, everybody's, you know, uh, where the technology currently is, client education for, you know, what's currently possible. Favorite thing in the world slash fresh, most frustrating thing in the world is, you know, you show somebody a past project or a sizzle reel or something like that, and then the first thing is, well, it's, it's a little soft, or I, I can see the pixels on the phone, you're like in a Samsung gear, and I'm like, mm-hmm, that, that, that's the norm, that's the current standard. And so it's funny, as far as VR technology has jumped forward, at the same time, we've also jumped back. We can immerse ourselves in a world that everybody's used to, you know, like 4K TVs and everything being super crystal sharp and amazing color. And then you're like, actually, you know, this is the resolution you can play that. This is your encoding options that you have. And, you know, things are, there's a little bit of a, you know, barn door effect and the lenses do this. And so it's really funny that everyone's initial expectations is they hype it up that's gonna be just as crystal clear as everything else. And they put the headset on and they're like, kind of bulky and you know I can see the pixels and we're like yep like that's just yeah, where it is as much as we've grown in the last couple of years like that's it's just where it is but don't worry it'll it'll go away you know and um, you know we uh, at our studio we always work at their archival format so it's the highest resolution possible and we always tell them you know just so that way you know, if two years from now there, there's a phone that's got like a really high dynamic range color and sharp display, but like we can just crank out a new render and it'll match it. So don't always, you know, I love when everybody, it's not so much the quality, like was this shot with GoPro? Like it was shot at 6K with a red dragon. It's the phone. And so that's, you know, just reminded me about that when you talked about how people talk about how bulky the headsets are. It's just funny when everyone first experiences VR, the immediate things that we're all so used to we just accept it as that's the standard, but everybody's first experience, all the comments, it's so funny. I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll go to Q&A, because I suspect you guys have your own. Um, what does uh, VR mean for the next generation of content creators, and what are you most excited about for the future of VR in 360, from each of you? Um, I think for me, it's, it's a new, it's a new kind of storytelling. Like it's, it's just, it's brand new. Um, it's not like film. It's not you know, like telling a story around a campfire. It's, it's a whole evolution of the next way to tell an immersive, an immersive story. Um, and uh, it's just gonna be exciting to see where people take it. I think we should actually look at the current generation of storytellers because a lot of the people who are getting into VR coming from traditional uh, or more traditional backgrounds or interactive media and um, uh, those are the people who are now making um, amazing pieces and um, so um, I think VR is, is indeed it's, it's a huge playground. We are, we are just at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. And, and we're just barely scratching, scratching the surface. What you're seeing right now, I think it's, it's gonna be vastly different from what you will see in 10 years from now or 20 years from now because we still have to uh, find out and figure out how this medium actually works effectively. 
and uh, and to that extent i think it is great that there uh, there are so many people getting into this medium and experimenting with it i look at it as ultimate freedom you can put anybody anywhere any situation whether it's real whether it's complete fantasy and it doesn't exist um, and that goes across everything whether it's cinematic you know storytelling or gaming or you get into education with kids where kids you know it's, we're going to take you to the louvre and you're going to see you know a virtual tour of all these sculptures and paintings or like you know the medical field where you know they're using vr to help people regain control of their leg muscles and stuff where they haven't been able to move their feet in 10 years and all of a sudden they can move their ankles and stuff just from vr so i look at it as ultimate freedom hmm. yeah i would agree with that I've, I've never been as excited as i am now in terms of of uh of being able to create content, and and a lot of it is is that open-endedness, and and the fact that right now it, it means that uh, you know my background is in film and television, but but I'm uh, increasingly dealing with gaming, and and uh, the the convergence of technologies is, is is incredibly exciting. The the fact that that people in all sectors are are looking at it, I mean, in terms of of media and entertainment, that's what we've worked at with. Uh, uh, over the last six years, but but now we're working with museums, we're working with uh, with hospitals that want to uh, improve the patient experience. So it's a really exciting time, and and there's a lot of collaboration taking place right now. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for people to catch up. You know, um, we were just talking uh, and and about you know friends and colleagues, and you know somebody looks at sort of a 360 video on their phone, and and we say we're working in VR, and somebody's like, oh yeah, I, I tried VR. You know, I, I don't think it's going anywhere, you know, and, and for me, it's like VR, saying you've tried VR is like saying you've tried the internet, you know, like there's just, there's so much happening and um, it's vast and it's, and it's very, very early. Another thing that I'm really excited about is I feel like some of the bigger companies and owners of some of these giant, you know, powerful technologies have learned from certain things that have happened in the past and are, they're, they're opening it up a lot and they're recognizing that the, the best way to spread the technology and get people excited about it is to, is to leave some of those tools out there for people to just try because I think the most exciting and powerful stuff that's gonna come from these technologies is by saying, you know, here, here's the specs, here's the stuff, what, what, it, what do you think will be useful for this? And people are just, you know, running with it and I think that that's, that's where the exciting stuff is gonna happen. I love the fact that you talked about that because I, I feel VR, you know, everybody is, you know, their own companies and realistically they're, you know, kind of competitors with each, uh, each other. But I really think that VR is so much of a f collaborative family right now because it's still very experimental. Nobody's figured it out. I have conversations all the time with other studios and the directors and, you know, supervisors being like, hey, have you ever tried this? What do you think about this? And everybody loves to help each other out and, yeah. you know, pass off ideas or, oh, have you checked out this new tool, this new camera? And, you know, even though everybody's kind of doing their own thing, everybody is all in it together at the same time. And people are solving the problems that, you know, we're spending six months trying to work around something that, that just can't be solved yet. And then you'll run into somebody in a situation like this and, Deep has solved this problem. You know, it's like forced perspective. We built that into our software. It's like, oh, thank God, you know, and then it's happening so fast. It's, it's really exciting. So actually, if you guys don't mind, we have about a couple minutes left. Do you guys have any questions? I'll toss it to the audience if there's anyone out there. Yes, in the front. This is oh. a bit of a loaded question. Oh, thank you. Um, so my question is, what is like the biggest obstacle that you think is faced with people like, you know, someone's grandma, somebody on the bus, or somebody who's just like new to VR, because I feel sometimes like, is this gonna be a fad? Is it gonna come here like a connect or something that's really cool and everybody's getting into it. Everybody's, you know, played rock band and it was huge for three years and then it went away and we'll never talk about it ever again. So for me, you know, like I, I really love VR. I still feel it's kind of niche, a niche, and uh, I want it to grow, and I want it to reach more people, and I want it to be something that's going to be so common, and everywhere you go, people are going to have, oh yeah, just put on the goggles and you're good to go. Um, what's the biggest hurdle facing, you know, the industry right now for people? Hey, checking out this new thing called VR. Everybody's got answers yeah. for this one. <laughs> I think it's just the limited amount of headsets that are out there. I think it's just a matter of time. I think, um, you know, it's experiential for a reason, and for that, if, because of that, it's so hard to explain. I mean, you know, I, we all, I'm sure, wanted to 
bring clips or have a slide, but you, you just can't, you don't know what it's like until you've been in there and experienced it. And with each new um, upgrade to the technology, it, it makes that gap between not having tried it and having tried something th that much bigger. Um, yeah, and I think the, the idea of it going away is, is um, it's a bad comparison because something like 3D or, you know, it's, 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 it's totally a different deal. Again, it's not just cinema, it's not just gaming. It's, it's, it's much broader than that. Like I, you know, like I say, the comparison I usually make is, is like the internet. The possibilities are so huge that um, you know, I don't think it's gonna go away. I, th I think also, I mean, you really have to, to, to realize how early stage this is. I mean, it is, it is, like, it's, uh, it is so much in the beginning and, and the, the headsets is one thing and, and the difference for me anyways in terms of, of VR and, and 3D is that it's, it's based on gaming it's based on you know film and television cinematic VR. The, the gaming side of things has built up over the, the last you know 10, 15. The the audience that's that's there, the, the the years of building up gaming, it's an extension of that. Even with the cinematic VR, what's happening now, although the, the 360 experience on a on YouTube or Facebook or whatever is is totally different than putting on a headset, what they're doing through through putting that up there and, and, and making that stuff available is they're getting people used to the fact that they are gonna look in 360. Mm -hmm. So people are starting, you know, young people growing up. I mean, I, mean, I think in terms of, 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 you know, I see a scene and I think of two shots and, and, and establishing shots and singles and whatever. For people to grow up and think about the, the, the 360 and, and the distance from camera to, 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 to objects, I mean, that's a whole different, uh, it's a different world. Yeah, kind of uh, go off what you guys already said, but I think uh, the distribution is probably the, the biggest hurdle is a lot of the stuff that people do, people don't have access to, to where um, a lot of the stuff that's on, you know, Facebook 360 and YouTube 360 is a lot of the cameras they're having just like prosumer 360 cameras coming out, like the Theta or the Samsung, Samsung 360, where anybody can go grab something and shoot something and then just upload it to where, you know, because um, headsets aren't easily available and stuff that, you know, there's the, the chance that somebody's very first VR experience might not be the best one and then they get turned off of it, mm -hmm. you know, to where, oh, what did you watch? I just watched something that somebody loaded on YouTube and you're like, oh, what would you think? They're like, it was terrible. I don't, I don't really like VR and 360. And that's part of, you know, it's just the distribution. You know, we've got different headsets, but it's always, you know, tethered on a computer or you're gonna download the apps and the phones and, you know, it's getting better. You know, there's de definitely more opportunities and more things, you know, even with the, the 360 video embedded in, you know, it's not the same, but it, it's preparing them and stuff like that. So I think um, once we kind of get the more like, mass distribution plan figured out, then it, uh, it'll definitely be here to stay. Because as soon as somebody finally gets a hold of something good and they see it for the first time, they love it and they're totally hooked. But it's just until we can get all the really good stuff out there to the masses, then it's just kind of a matter of who can get a hold of a headset and what happens to be the very first thing they ever see because that's what they have access to and stuff like that. I think that mobile phones and mobile devices also play a really important role in this, that they give uh, accessibility for, uh, to a mass audience. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, what I see now, it really is a trend among broadcasters, especially in, uh, in Europe, is that they're really catching on to this pl new platform and they see it as a new platform in addition to radio mm -hmm. and television. Now they're expanding to VR and they're creating dedicated content on this uh, platform and it becomes more and more of a quality experience. And the fact that broad broadcasters see this as their next move because tr traditional TV broadcasting is, is kind of um, dying away a little bit because of the, the internet and everything. This uh, VR is really opening a new world for broadcast industry. Um, one of the challenges, I think, is uh, the quality of the experiences available currently. And indeed, what you said, there, there is so much out there that is not up to the standard because it's so in its infancy that people can get easily put off. And I think it will take a little while before we have enough uh, high quality and high quality standards, both technically and creatively, that people will accept this as, as sort of the, uh, a, norm, uh, a, a normal medium. Um, but I definitely think that it is here to stay. What we see now is a bit of uh, too much hype and it will, it will plunge. It will go down at some point, but then it will catch up gradually and then it will sort of, it, it will definitely stay there as a new medium. Cool. Um, yes. 
one, one of these fine people. Yeah, I uh, was just wondering, what's the highest resolution then that comes at the, uh, the VR? You say you, don't, you, you, don't, you can't do 6K or 4K. What, what is the highest resolution that comes? Um, that's kind of... Uh, <laughs> it's a when, are you, when are you asking? <laughs> like, it, this is one of those things that does change literally, you know, you know day to day, every week, every month. Yeah. A, new dis a new display comes out, a new headset comes out. Um, there's new standards on the web, new standards on, on the phones. Um, we say right now, are we talking about a 4K... Samsung is creating 8K displays. That would only yeah. be for um, uh, for VR because there's no point in making 8K phone displays. Yeah. So that's that's one of the signs. But there are two different ways of approaching resolution. You have the resolution of the entire screen, and then you have the resolution that is visible that you're looking at at any one given time. And that also depends on the bandwidth that you're streaming something of, or have you pre-downloaded something? What is your device's capability of playing back uh, so many? Uh, data, so it, it depends on the number of uh, factors. But yeah, it gets very technical. Um, you know, if it's if it's gaming, it's all about um, you know like frame rates, uh, refresh, things like that, and you know what kind of PC you're running on and how you know high resolution textures you can do. If it's pre-rendered content, it goes back to the distribution question iPhones can play a different resolution and bit rate than the Gears can, than the Rift and the Vive, and so it's a wide variety, and part of it kind of goes back to um, if the client tells me I want it for the Rift, it's going to be a higher quality, higher resolution, you know, it's going to be a 4K and not just under 4K, like a UHD, um, and if they tell me it's for a Gear, and then same thing where it goes back to the limitations of the phones, even just the bit rate that you encode something at, depending on the color palette of the piece and the frame rate, you have to uh, do an MP4, basically an H.264, H.265 encoding. And so that immediately takes, you know, say you shot something at 6K, by the time it gets compressed down into this codec for the phone, your 6K image looks almost like GoPro. But then in reality, if you take GoPro footage and do the same thing, it'll be even less. And so a lot of it's just device limitations. But I would say, you know, 4096 by 2048 is probably one of the big ones for stuff. And then from there, it's kind of, you know, different frame rates that you can play at. And with each one, you know, if you do a higher frame rate, you can't do as a high of a bit rate. And so the quality goes down a little bit. But if you lower the bit rate or lower the resolution slightly, you can cram a higher bit rate in so the overall quality gets higher. So it's a really kind of give and take right now, completely dependent on what's your final like viewing platform and what you're trying to get out of it. But eventually, you know, like every two months something changes. So there'll be, you know, the new Galaxy Note 7 came out, and then you know there was the commercial release of the the Rift finally versus the DK2, and so it's just kind of a waiting game. And then as the technology increases, it won't be necessarily that we'll be immediately jumping to like 8K and 10K plates in VR. It'll just be that are nice four, five, six here, whatever we're shooting at or rendering at, we'll finally get like an honest look at it. And you actually get to see how beautiful these images are. And then once it catches up to that, then you know we'll take the next step and then wait for the technology to catch up. Um, oh, there's someone in the back. Hi, um, a little bit of a theory question. Uh, how important is the element of aura for the production of new VR um, like ideas and concepts and, and pieces. Because your comment about let's go to the museum kind of reminded me of how maybe VR is kind of breaching the gap between seeing an art piece in real life and going to the cinema. Um, so, like, is, is that an element that you think about when creating new stuff in VR? I only heard part of your question. <laughs> what did you mean with aura? Yeah. Um, just like. Theoretically, the idea that when you're in the presence of an art piece, there's a different connection between the viewer or the audience and the piece versus going to the cinema and knowing that this is not in real life, that the objects are not there. Um, and I just want to believe that VR kind of breaches that gap. But I see what she's saying. She's basically saying, you know, like if you, you go to a movie and you go to the cinema, you're you're sitting down and you know walking in, you're being told a story on a screen versus if you go to an actual museum and you see an art piece in real life and the way you connect with it and see it and the way that VR kind of bridges the gap of like you can tell a non-real like story, but it 
it feels real to you and it feels like you're there and that you're totally correct with it's it's bridging the gap and going back to his points about how important you know like directors are and storytellers that um, the better the story and the thought put into the story the better that um, gap is bridged to actually make you feel like you're there and you're a part of it versus the way that you just kind of sit back in a chair and you know it's fake and you know it's just playing on a screen in front of you and things like that. I, I think it's still it's still an interesting like kind of psychological and philosophical question about can you you know are you in like the holodeck where everything is you know not just photoreal but real um, and you, know, you had the interesting uh, story about your son. I was just going to ask right? to tell you that. Who, um, you, you can tell it. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so my, my son is four years old and uh, um, he's been playing around with VR since he was two, but when he could verbalize what he was experiencing, um, and we don't do this very often, but uh, he, he put on the, the headset and um, the first thing he says is, mommy, where are you? Because he's in a new scene, but he doesn't see mommy, and he's expecting me to be there um, next to him. And then he walks around, and then uh, he puts the device off, and he says, "Mommy, I was somewhere else." And and to him, that is total, that is reality. That is what he accepts at that moment. Um, I just wanted to talk about uh, this this sort of aura of the real. I think what what VR is also very strong at doing is uh, it, it plays an important role in uh, preservation. So, for instance, preservation of uh, certain images or uh, buildings that will not be there in some time from now. Um, for instance, we shot in Africa la a couple of months ago, we shot the, the last white rhino. And now in VR, you can, uh, you can experience that beast being next to you in, 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 in real, at real scale and see how, how that animal is around you. And you can really feel that. Um, we shot uh, elephant tusks that are being burned at this um, a big event of the the, uh, um, the tusks that they confiscate from the um, um, uh, from the, uh, the the poachers, and um, we can show this in photogrammetry. You can walk around the tusk the tusks. It's all in 3D and it's all one on one. So you can see and Im and, and understand how grand this pile is. And this can, you cannot do in any other medium. You can only do this in virtual reality. One, one of the nice things, too, about, about VR, as we've talked about, is, is that it's open-ended and there's lots of questions. And, and your question actually raises a question for me that, that uh, I think is interesting in terms of the work we're doing with museums and galleries, is does the experience of, of a piece of art uh, in that museum or that gallery, how does that compare to the experience of that same piece of, of art or that same installation in a VR experience? Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm not sure how that, that sense of, of aura or presence actually transfers. Uh, it's an interesting question. So I hate to do this, but the lights dimming mean that we are, we are wrapping up. But um, thank you guys so much, and thank you guys for coming and having this conversation. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Randall, we're following you.